Welcome everyone to this episode of the Palmetto Guardian. I'm Sergeant Chelsea Weaver, and today we have a full house. Um, I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves, and then we're going to go into today's topic. So we'll start with you. My name is Demetrius Evans. I've been in the National Guard for 17 years. I'm a recruiter for the greenwood Abbeville area. I'm Brandon Parker. I recruit out of Sumter. I've been in the Guard about two, two and a half years now. Uh, all my prior time was active duty. I'm Andy Brunson, and I am the on-campus recruiter at the University of South Carolina. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate everybody coming here. We have a lot of good stuff to talk about, so we're just going to jump right in. Um, so the first thing I kind of want to go over that we talked about beforehand is there's kind of this disconnect with this new the upcoming generation with the Guard and them not knowing what the Guard is and what it has offers, have to offer. So what reasons do you guys think that there's that separation versus several years ago? Well, one one big problem I think that we all had to deal with was COVID. Um, that stopped a lot of interaction in schools between recruiters and the students. Um, also, sometimes, you know, if you only have one recruiter in the area and he's trying to or she's trying to get to all of those students, sometimes you come a little short, and that's where networking comes in. And, I mean, it's just possible that, you know, we kind of got overwhelmed or we didn't get the right amount of networking at that time. Uh, I think we're doing a really good job now. Uh, we've plussed up the ranks with recruiters, so we have help, and we're able to touch, you know, actually reach out and touch more students and, and people in the community. So w with that, what are some reasons and benefits that the Guard has to offer for pe new people who are looking to enlist? So specifically for our college students, um, it's a great way to pay your tuition, get through college, and with the National Guard being only part-time, it really doesn't inter interfere with your academics. Um, you drill one weekend a month, we pay you to go to school, and most of your tuition is covered, depending on what institution you go to. On the flip side of that, I think we lose this sometimes coming from just being like a street recruiter, high school recruiter. We offer more than college. Like those, that, that money can go towards certificate programs such as welding, truck driving, you know, kind of whichever way you want to push it. Uh, college is a great thing, and sometimes we don't go because maybe the funds are not there. But some people just don't want to go to college, you know. So we offer both, you know, an opportunity for you to succeed in the community and in college. Mm -hmm. Now, with the benefits in education and stuff, I know that previous – Previously, a lot of recruits or new soldiers would say that education was a huge part of why they joined. Do you think that there's other um, aspects of the Guard that they that make someone to join versus just the education benefits? Absolutely. Um, I think for me personally, one of the huge benefits was that my family is here and I get to still be here with my family. It's important to me to see my mom on Saturdays and see my dad on Sundays at church. Um, so for me, one of the big things was that I get to serve here in my community, and I still get to see my family 365 days a year, if that's what I want. Um, it's especially when you start thinking about things like, do I want to join the Guard as a parent? Where will my children be? Um, it, it's difficult when you start thinking about things like active duty versus the Army National Guard. I personally served on active duty. Um, and whenever I got to a duty station, I'd have to figure out where my kids were going to go. Now, I know that they can go to my mom's house as opposed to some stranger or trying to find daycare. Um, it helps you have some peace of mind while serving. Um, and, it, and it increases just the, the mobility of the soldier to move around and serve in their community. Mm -hmm. That's the same for me when I was enlisting. I had so many people that I knew from high school that went active duty and the stories you hear, obviously, I mean, everybody has different experiences, sure. but my main thing was I don't want to be told where I need to go every two or three years. I love living in South Carolina. Like, so I'm still able to serve and also still be a, a part of my community and not have to worry about getting up and, going thousands of miles away. Um, but I do kind of want to touch back on the part-time side. If we could just go a little bit more into the detail of that, because I think that that's a huge 
selling asset for people who are considering it because you know that your unit is going to be somewhere within South Carolina. Um, and the other thing too with that is the jobs. When I first enlisted, I was military police and I didn't look into the other opportunities. It was kind of like, this is available. Are you interested? And I'm like, sure, why not? I heard a lot of people have fun at training and stuff. So I was like, I'll do that. But I wasn't a police officer in the civilian world. So it's nice that you can also do something completely different in the guard that you're not doing in the civilian world. Or there are people who do follow the same career path in the guard as well as the civilian side because it helps further their education, their experience and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of want to touch on both of those. So yeah, for me, um, I joined the Army, the Army National Guard as a military intelligence analyst. So that was a completely different job than what I did on the outside. On the outside, I'm a scientist, work in a hospital, laboratory professional, you know, um, drawing blood, running tests, doing all those sorts of things in healthcare. And so to come into a field where I actually got to learn about what the Army really was. Intelligence analysts actually... um, we do something called battlefield preparation. So we're constantly with the commander. We're constantly, you know, learning what weapon systems that we have. We're, these are things that I would have never learned, you know, in a hospital setting. Mm-hmm. These are things that you don't even think about in a hospital setting. So I don't know who else has that kind of similar experience. I, I kind of do as well. Our stories are pretty similar. You know, I was eight years active duty as a counter intel agent. Um, tempo was crazy and I came back I did a contract job with it but of course they wanted me to move somewhere else again when I was trying to stabilize you know so I ended up becoming a state trooper right here in South Carolina for a couple years and it's a totally different like on other extremes of holding a badge you know counter intel stuff you know we talk about national security crimes versus you didn't have your seatbelt on today you know what I mean so um it was fun for me, though, because as I got to do, you know, see something new with Highway Patrol, I still got to do what I loved with the National Guard. You know, and it allowed me not only the opportunity, you know, she brought up family. The reason I left active duty was to start a family. Like, you know, the tempo was too much. Um, I think with the Guard, you can kind of pick what tempo you want. You know, if you want to be more active here, you know, you can sign Correct. up for different, you know, things and a lot of it stateside it it doesn't deal with you know I think people got caught up with wartime mentality you know like Iraq Afghanistan Iraq Afghanistan um but you know I think the intel company right here yeah the intel company on McIntyre is like I mean they go to DC for three months at a time and I mean it's you get to learn you get you still get to do your job and it, it just opens up a lot of great opportunities you know the flexibility of the guard does so besides um, the education benefits, being able to be have a stable family life and all that kind of stuff, are there any other benefits for somebody to want to join the Guard? Or is that pretty much the two biggest things? Absolutely. So um, health insurance is very important to me. On the civilian side, I was paying a lot for health insurance. Um, having a family, three kids, health insurance can be very expensive. The National Guard family plan is, I think, very competitive. I only pay like $198 per month for a family plan, and that's been able to help me greatly. So I know that with, obviously with anything you do, there's always, not concerns, but you're cautious about certain things because you you don't know what to expect. You don't know what the unknown holds. And a lot of times those things can affect people's decisions but a big thing that I know we were talking about before is the perception of basic training and there's a lot of people who get scared or timid because they don't know what to expect with it and obviously when we all went through however many years ago it's a lot different now but um, what are things that we could talk about maybe to help break that perception of basic and to allow people to know that it's not as bad as what they think it is or it's not what you see in the movies like you were talking about with the whole wartime thing like it's a whole other different world and the movies and the tv shows and all that portray it in a different way so can we kind of touch a little bit about on that 
Yeah, it's it's way different now. Um, matter of fact, when I came in in 2010 at uh, Fort Benning, there was no females allowed mm-hmm. in the infantry program. You know, now if you're a female and you want to be an infantry person, that opportunity is to you. You know, uh, it, it took me a while of actually all of last year was kind of a shock for me because I was putting people in the National Guard and they're texting me on the week like, hey, week two was fun or, you know, right. week three, this part kind of wasn't cool. But, um, you know, I think physically, too, people people get – way too caught up around the spokes on the physicality of it. You know, drill sergeants aren't there to hurt you. I think that's a stigma that people's gotten from movies. You know, those people are trained to train you, and their job is to get you through. And it actually looks negative on them if they don't get all of their soldiers through. So they're not going to push you to do something that you're not capable of, uh, and they help you along the way. I know the phone thing's a big deal now. I mean – you know, we got kids five, six years old that probably operate my iPhone better than me. <laughs> so, you know, when you take that away from somebody, it's a big shock. So just just allowing them to use it, you know, again, trying not to date myself, but at Benin, I made two phone calls. One was, Mama, I made it. The second one was, Y'all want to see me graduate, you know. Mm-hmm. So the communication is a lot better. Um, I mean, basics, really. It's It was kind of the easiest time of my life. I don't know about for y'all, but. You know, they told me when to eat, told me when to get dressed, told me what we were doing, told me when I was going to bed, um, and I got paid. So, mm-hmm. I mean. I, I, t- I say all the time, I'm, I tell them when whenever they're asking me these questions about basic training, um, sometimes you need to give somebody a little bit of relatability. If I can make it, you can make it. Mm-hmm. You know, we are we are not coming off of the couch any different than the next person is. Um, Surely you're going to get to basic training. You're going to see people there that are what we in the Army call PT studs, the people that do 500 push-ups a day. They've been doing CrossFit for years. You know, the only thing that they know is fitness. Mm -hmm. They eat right, and they make all the right decisions. I mean, the reality of it is is that we're people, and we eat food, whatever that food Mm -hmm. looks like, we sit on the couch, we watch TV, and then one day we all get up and go to basic training and we make it. And we make it because you have people there that are specifically trained to make sure that you make it. Um, another thing that, you know, that I tell my applicants when I see them is, you know, there's only two places that you get paid to work out. The Olympics and the Army. <laughs> like, there's nowhere yeah. else. And I'm like, so you're there 100% mm-hmm. of the time working out and someone's giving you money to do that I mean and that's your only focus Mm -hmm. just get in shape no big deal you know um, you're going to learn so many things there that you aren't even aware that you're learning while you're learning them Mm -hmm. because there's a program in place to make sure that that happens this is why when you do see your friends on the street and they come back from basic training you're like you're different Mm -hmm. you're different they don't notice it but you notice it and it'll be the same for you when you get ready to go. Mm-hmm. So, And a lot of the applicants that I work with are athletes. Mm-hmm. So I use that as a thing to entice them to go to basic training. Like, um, if you're an athlete, you're going to be challenged and you're going to be pushed. And there's other athletes there that are going to push you. Mm-hmm. And that's going to take care of the physical portion. The mental portion is going to come. Mm-hmm. Each week is going to get easier. Uh, the first two weeks is probably the hardest. After the first two weeks, you're going to move into some actual training. And the drill sergeants are really there to make sure you don't hurt yourself mm-hmm. or hurt anyone else. Yeah, I like what all y'all said because it makes me think of when I went. And don't think you have to be, like you were saying, you do not have to be a PT stud to go to basic. Yeah. I could not do one push-up. I was probably 20 or 30 pounds lighter than I am. And by the end of it, I don't even know how many I could do, but I know I could do more than one. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so don't think like – and I like what you guys said, like, it's about the experience. You're going to do stuff you never thought you were ever going to do. The military has offered me, and I mean, it sounds like each of y'all, amazing opportunities that you never would have had if you didn't have these experiences. I mean, I've I've gone, I've been able to go to different training because of being in the Guard. I've been able to have specific jobs because of the Guard. I've gotten free training to do my job. Yeah. So, I mean, there's just so many good benefits out there. Not just the education and stuff, which is great because obviously a lot of kids come out of school want to 
they don't want to have to worry about paying for college. So the guard is a great option, but there's definitely a lot of other benefits. And I like what you're saying about basic where they tell you what to do. They tell you to get up. They tell you when to eat and all that stuff. They make you do crazy stuff. Like I remember in the chow line, holding your cups a certain <laughs> way, the, the spoon to the bowl or whatever type thing. And when you're doing it, you think like, this is the most stupid thing I could ever do in my life. Like, what am I doing? Yeah. But there's a purpose. It's like the karate kid. Mm -hmm. He's having him wax on. <laughs> he's having him wax off. And he doesn't think that it's doing anything for him. But then in the end, he realizes that there's a purpose. And that's exactly what basic training is like. And everyone's experience obviously is different. And whatever your MOS is for your annual train or your AIT, your advanced individual training, right, yes. um, is going to be different. But you mean, like, I have friends from basic that I still talk to. Absolutely. And so you build that connection in those families that are always there for you. And you go through that experience together that no one else, a lot of people don't get to experience. Don't. So you build friendships and family as well. And you just gain so much knowledge. So it's just awesome. And uh, Sergeant Evan said something that kind of sparked something in my mind just then. Uh, he's talking about college and athletes, you know, and obviously, if you can make it through football camp, you're going to sure. be okay, you mm -hmm. know, at basic. But I think a lot of uh, a young adults coming out of high school, they're really focused on, like, I'm going to be in the NFL. I'm going to be in the NBA. I'm getting a D1 scholarship. I don't think they ever think that they could do that and still serve with us. You know, I think they kind of get caught up about that. And that's that's one of the things I'm working really hard in Sumter right now because I get a lot of people It's like, man, I, I'm – I'm going to be D1. You know, it's like, well, cool, but do you have health insurance? You know what I mean? Like, okay. do you understand? Well, we have athletes in the guard yeah. that we've actually had on the podcast yeah. that I didn't know, but you make a great point. Like, yeah. you can still do both. Yeah, you can start your retirement while you're playing as a D1 athlete. Mm -hmm. sure. And if it pans out, cool. If it doesn't, you still have that retirement, you still have that insurance, and you still have that backup plan because I know, you know, I don't know a commander around that if there was a D1 athlete, they wouldn't work with their drill times to make it fit around Whenever. what the college is doing, yeah. you know, sports-wise. So um, there, that that part, again, that flexibility thing, that's uh, that ought to be the motto of the guard, in my opinion, flexibility. Sure, right. mm, sure. So. And, I, and I just wanted to just add another, another thing, because sometimes I, you know, I get females – that, that have a whole lot of questions about mm -hmm. kind of what we do and, you know, what op those opportunities look like. And, you know, when Song Park is talking about, like, females can be infantry. When I came in, females couldn't be infantry. Mm -hmm. You know, when I came in, females couldn't be artillery. They couldn't be tankers. You know, they couldn't do so many things. And so as society has changed and evolved, so have we, you know, as a military unit. Um, it's it's been amazing to me to see these females that are out there going hard in, you know, infantry schools, going to Fort Benning, competing with these males for different, you know, tabs and certificates that there was never a chance. I mean, um, and what was happening was for us as females, we when it came time for promotion, when it came time for all of those incentives, we kind of didn't get them mm -hmm. because the males would always have all of that extra stuff. Um, and so I think that now that we're listening to the, no, we can do this thing too, you know, that's huge. Um, and then the last thing that, I, you know, body type. So, so many times, you know, civilians will see certain people and they look at you where you are now, you know, and they say, well, there's no way that I could be there. They see us working out and they're like, there's no way that I can do that many push-ups, or there's no way, you know, that I could do that many sit-ups. And I think that sometimes just the reality of understanding, like I couldn't do, I didn't even know what a push-up was when I joined the army. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just was not that kind of girl. I wasn't, I wasn't that, that person. Um, I couldn't run. I couldn't do any of those things. And I'm skinny, you know? So, it doesn't matter, like, what, I mean, now the way that we have changed our PT and our athletics in the Army, you know, it really kind of equals out mm -hmm. everybody and where you are and your strengths. 
and it really exploits your strengths in a positive way um, that I don't think that we had before when we were just doing push-ups, sit-ups, and running. They're focusing on nutrition a lot now, too, which is definitely is so important. And recovery. Um, mm-hmm. Like, we didn't have... There was none of that. Like, yep. if you got hurt, you just got hurt. <laughs> but <laughs> but nowadays, we understand, like, if you get hurt, you need physical therapy. In my first eight years, there was no no such thing as a chiropractor, and now we have right. one on Fort Jackson. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's... Right. Like, you couldn't get cleared to go to a chiropractor, and now you have it. You have massage therapists and different things you right. can do. So Yeah, All the possibilities are starting to become a lot better and the resources are getting a lot better as well. But I kind of want to go back to the um, the flexibility part. For those who are in high school or even attending college, how does it work with if they are on the fence of joining? Um, I know a lot of people don't want to miss a semester or they don't want to miss their, f- their first semester of college and stuff like that. So how does the guard work around that as far as joining and going through basic and their AIT and all that kind of stuff. I'll let one of them two talk about yeah, SMP. So, we, <laughs> yeah. so, so the guard, <laughs> and, and I tell people all the time, you know, now that I am an on-campus recruiter, I mean, we want you to go to school. 90% of the people that you're around on a drill weekend probably have a degree in something, whether they're enlisted or they're all officers. It amazes me some of the talent that we see. But um, specifically to that question, um, there is certain paperwork that we submit to say you are in school. You are in school from this date to this date, and you can only train in these dates. Um, College is important to us, you know, and it's one of the things that we talked about at the very beginning of this you know, how we pay for that and how we encourage you to get those degrees, how our in-state schools support that. So the Army National Guard has to be on board with what those schools are doing. So ultimately, the semesters are designed the way they are. Sometimes you can miss a semester if that's what you want to do. Sometimes we can design it to where you don't have to miss a semester. There are certain MOSs that you can train and you can leave only in the summertime come right back in the fall, jump right back into school, finish your your degree, never having missed a beat, Mm -hmm. but having gained those benefits along the way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, I mean, we have MOSs that we specifically know that during the summer you can go to basic training, you can finish your AIT, you will be back here by August the 17th or whatever the date is that we design, and you'll be back in school, you know, as a, freshman, sophomore, wherever you happen to be matriculating in your education at that time. Mm -hmm. One of the best things for like high school kids, so, you know, they deal a lot with the Mm -hmm. college and that's, that's where you get into the simultaneous membership program and stuff. But for high school, the split training option, I really wish somebody would have talked to me out of the guard when (laughs) I was in high school, like, because you can go to basic in between your junior, Mm -hmm. senior year. That was going to be my next question. You come (laughs) back, yeah, you come back to school and then in between you know, you graduate and going to college, you do your AIT, you never missed anything. You already started your retirement. Like, you, you're you a 17-year-old with retirement started. You missed no stuff, and you're getting your school paid for. Mm-hmm. Like, And really, by the time, if you start at 17, by the time you graduate college, like, you're up to re-enlist or commission. You know what oh, I mean? Man. Like, you, you're already on to the next part of, your career with us while you start your new career Mm -hmm. in the civilian world. Yeah. You're earning, you're going to high school and you're earning a paycheck every month because you're still going to drill through RSP, not your unit until you go through your training. But that's a huge benefit. And like you said, I, I knew people because we had a big presence in our school with recruiters for the national guard and I was an ROTC and all that, but I I was on the fence and I wasn't sure. And I saw some of my peers going and they would walk around with their backpacks and like they would go to drill on certain weekends and stuff. And now that I, and then after I graduated, when I decided, I was like, man, I would have already been in for like a year and a half at this point. Like, so, I mean, and not, pre- not saying that people need to enlist at 17. Cause I mean, that's a huge decision and you also have to have parental consent. But um, I think it's a great opportunity if it's something that you truly want to do and that you think will benefit you. 
it just adds on to the list of things that you can receive from the National Guard. And that's huge. I mean, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's huge. Honestly, I mean, that's the (laughs) ideal way Mm -hmm. to handle the beginning of your Guard career. I mean, I, I came from a street recruiter just a year ago, and I would tell them, I would tell the kids all the time, take the ASVAB now. Take it while you're in in school. We can use that, you know, that test that you took in high school. We can use that for your enlistment later. Like, do it now. Join while you're in the eleventh grade. Do it. I mean, because you you don't even realize the opportunity that you're setting yourself up for when you do it that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, like you said, it's a huge commitment, and not everybody's going to do it that way. But if you know that that's what you want to do, because I mean, for me, I always knew that I was going into the army. So I, I come from an army family, so it wasn't a it wasn't rocket science for me. It was like I'm gonna join the army. Like, what else am I gonna do with my life? Um, but if I had known that I could have joined at 17, mm-hmm. I mean, I I would have been gone. You know, so yeah, that's yeah. that's huge. Mm-hmm. So I like that you brought that up because um, I don't remember if I took the ASVAB. I think I took it after. And now looking back, I'm like, I probably could have got a higher score. But can you go into that? Because I know it was different back then versus now. What's the process for um, students in high school and even college or whoever wants to join? What's the process now in taking the ASVAB? So you can still take it in school, right? Most of your schools are going to offer several tests per year, uh, which one of us, probably from each branch, is going to be in there to help proctor that test. Um, Sometimes we get the opportunity to go over your results with you and really explain, you know, what specific scores mean and all of that. When it comes to the ASVAB, things that I've noticed, and this is this is another big push that I'm constantly working at in Sumter, is a lot of the scores are down. Um, and it's not that the students aren't learning the information, right? It's that kind of the way these questions are asked are a little different. And there's ways to prepare these students right now so that when they get to that test, you know what I mean, they, mm-hmm. don't, they don't do poorly and then get discouraged, you know. Um, when we were coming through school, I'm sure you had those old math word problems where, you know, it's this long paragraph and you have to write the stuff down and figure it out. I'm not really seeing that in school nowadays. Mm-hmm. So there's certain – you know, like, obviously, as recruiters, we have study material, but there's a book um, that Kaplan's putting out, an uh, ASVAB prep book, and they update it each year. It's really, really good. I've had a lot of, of good success from people who use that book. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that I think is overlooked by a student is you have tutors all day at school. Like, you have a math teacher. You have a science teacher. You have an English teacher. So, if we give you a practice test or you take the ASVAB and we tell you, like, hey, these are the areas you're not doing great in, here's some study material. Such a good point. We may not be the tutor that's going to be able to help you understand mm-hmm. it, but I promise you those teachers want to see you do the best you can do. So, you know, a lot of this comes down to, you know, you as a person, what do you want, and are you willing to ask that teacher, like, hey, hey could you help me with this after class mm-hmm. so that you understand it? And then – um. You know, there's another thing about the ASVAB, another small point. They don't, they don't allow calculators. Um, I think every, everything else is kind of on the calculators now, you know, like mm-hmm. SAT or whatever. Mm-hmm. But that's something that we can overcome too. Like if we know you can't use it on this test, you know, back in the day we did multiplication tables. You know what I mean? You can, mm-hmm. you can study that for a couple of weeks, and that, that'll just prepare you so that when you start working out those problems, you can do that quick math and get there. Um, also – it would be very beneficial, you know, if there's any parents listening. If your child wants to take the ASVAB, like don't kind of push that to the side on them and then make it not important, you know what I mean? Because this is something that they may want to do, and as a parent, you can help your child as well. You know, I mean, I think uh, my baby's about to be two, but you have older children. I think you end up becoming a teacher by the time they get to a certain age, you know, so – there's, there's a lot of help that it's just us all coming together, you know what I mean, to mm-hmm. help to help these kids get where they need to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I like that you point out the importance of the ASFAB because um, I have found that there are there are times that people just don't take it that seriously. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, they see the Army. Um, 
they see us on our drill weekends, right? They see us playing, they see us mm-hmm. laughing, and they see us having a good time. And we look like we're a super fun organization, which I would 100% agree with. Um, but they don't understand that there are tests and specialties that these people in this uniform have had to endure to get to those jobs and those positions that they had. And the ASFAB is that first step. Um, The ASFAB is an aptitude test that tells us what jobs you will qualify for. And when we say qualify for, we mean that we want you to go to an AIT and we want you to be successful. We want you to have a job that you can excel in and do well in. So we test you to see how many of those different occupations that are out there that would that would maybe fit kind of the criteria for, you know, your intellect or how you think or how you kind of work problems or what your mechanic ability is. Um, you know, I've seen people that do very, very well in the math portion, but not as well, you know, in the reading portion or do, you know, amazing in the arithmetic portion and not as well, you know, in the reading portion. And it tells us something about the way that you think um, and kind of the way your brain operates so that we put you in the right job Mm -hmm. so that we're not asking you to do something that, you know, is going to hurt your self-esteem later because you didn't do well. Um, So just take it seriously, you know, and, and, and understand that just like you know, your SAT is required for you to get into a college or university or your ACT is required for you to get into a college and university. Um, This is a professional organization. And, you know, we too have that entrance exam level um, test Mm -hmm. that we require for you to get into this organization. Mm -hmm. I like that you um, were talking about the changes in school and stuff because, I mean, this whole podcast basically is about how it's evolved. Everything's evolved over time. So with that is, has the ASVAB changed over time because of the way that schools are teaching or is it still flat out the same across the board? That's the big problem. And I think that's what Sarn Parker is getting at Mm -hmm. is it hasn't gotcha. You know, it's, it's the same kind of standardized test And so now we have this evolution of school, Mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily have this evolution of how we test for that entrance, you know, how you how we make it available for you to have this opportunity. But I will say um, one of the other things that I've seen students use is apps on their phone. Yes, because, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these kids even in high school, they have jobs, Mm -hmm. they're working after school and they don't necessarily have the, you know, we talk about, you know, they don't play outside as much as they used to or whatever, but even when they get older, you know, they're still not, I mean, they are at work. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to download an app from the app store on their phone where they can kind of look at some of the questions and they can click on answers, those apps are interactive, Um, And they really kind of give them something that they can carry in their hand um, just because they're not used to carrying a book all the time. I mean, they're, I mean, we don't even, I don't even know if they issue books in school. I know they get like Chromebooks. Yeah, they get a Chromebook. And so everything is on there. So, you know, to be able to have that handheld device where, you know, you have everything that you need on there. And oh, by the way, you also have your ASVAB study material that your recruiter was telling you about. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Is there anything that we haven't talked about or discussed that anybody would like to throw out there before we kind of close out? Um, this this is good because it, it can reach so many people. You know, um, the three components of the Army, you know, your active, your reserve, and your National Guard. Uh, there's major differences in all three, and we touched on what we can do in the Guard. Mm-hmm. And obviously we know about active duty. And I'm going to speak for myself on I don't – not every person that comes in my office is going to go in the National Guard. Mm-hmm. Okay, there are some people that their situation in life dictates maybe they need a change, like they, they have to make money right now, they need a full-time job, whatever, right? A- active duty is that route, okay? However, when you go that route, like we spoke earlier, you're getting told where you're going, you're going to be moving, you're taking away that, you know, I live here, here's my family type deal, right? Um, the reserves, I talk with their recruiters a good bit now. Um, I didn't at first. 
But I've actually been in all three because the guard didn't have a 35, you know, Lima slot for me when I came off active duty. So I was in the reserve. Um, And that's the kind of specialty that the reserves has. We offer more money for school than all of them because you got federal and state tuition with us. Um, So if you're going to do part-time coming out of school, the guard is the way to go. You know, there's certain specifics when I talk about the reserves, like availability of a job coming off active duty or something then that's kind of your route, you know, because mm-hmm. they have more opportunities on that side. But um, it's just been really important for me to actually discuss this because you can get a recruiter to come through and they give you like three or four minutes and you're like, man, that's that's awesome. But they didn't really tailor it to you mm-hmm. and what you needed in your life, you know, and that's where we talk about flexibility. The majority of the people here, they may want to move a little further off, like away from mom and dad or something or out of their town. But they're not really ready to, hey, you're going to Alaska. Three Mm -hmm. years later, you're going over, you know. And that's another thing. Like, everybody tells you, oh, you're going to Hawaii and Germany and Japan. (laughs) I, no. um, I mean, but you have those opportunities to do that stuff in the National Mm -hmm. Guard. And I think that sometimes we do overlook that. I mean, you touched on it a little bit when you were talking about um, ADA and Intel that they deployed to D.C. I mean, that's huge. Mm -hmm. You know, that we that we in the Army National Guard take care of this country specifically. We take care of our states specifically. Um, I mean, I remember I was in the Guard in 2015 when we had the flood. Um, and a lot of people, I mean, they can't tell the difference between who we are because we all wear the same uniform. And that's just, right. you know, what you talked about, you know, us being under the big Army umbrella. And so you don't know if somebody's Army National Guard or, or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, I will tell you that at that time, Fort Jackson was closed. Um, it was the, the gates were locked. You could only use the facility, you know, if you lived on that facility. It was the Army National Guard that was outside in the community, you know, doing everything from getting cats out of trees to getting people out of their flooded homes. And so I, I, I just want to, to make sure that, you know, people understand that that's us. Yeah. That's, the, that's your Army National Guard. That's your South Carolina Army National Guard. That's our mission. Set. That, you yeah. know. Our helicopters were flying into these locations. Our medics were the ones that were treating patients when, you know, the the hospitals were closing down to to people during the pandemic. Our medics were on active duty doing that kind of stuff. Our truck drivers, when there were no other trucks moving on the roads, you know, and things couldn't get delivered, we were the ones calling up our 88 mics and saying, can you do this delivery? Because they are truck drivers. They are CDL holders. And so when when the world can't do whatever it is that they need to do, you know, it's it's us that steps in and says, okay, yeah, we, we have truck drivers. Mm-hmm. We can deliver this material to you. We have medics that are professionally trained to do specific jobs we have MPs. Our military police are the ones that were the ones that were pulling security during the flood mm-hmm. in locations where you couldn't have civilians out pulling security because it wasn't safe. Um, I mean, you talked about being an MP. You were probably one of those yeah, people I that was, was <laughs> sleeping in the armories. Sleeping in know, the Humvees. Sleeping yeah. in the Humvees pulling security because we didn't have... We, we, didn't, we just couldn't have our civilians out in that weather, in the danger. They're not, they're not trained for that kind of stuff. That's what we do. Mm-hmm. You know, our, our, you know, girls and boys that you see walking by you in Walmart all the time are the ones that on Saturday and Sunday put on that uniform and they morph into a completely different being. And so, you know, when it was time for the flood, everybody was on, yep. mm-hmm. you know. When I was with Highway Patrol, hurricanes. Yes. We worked hand in hand. Mm-hmm. You know, with right. the guard. You yeah. know, Highway you know, Patrol. I mean, yeah, they they would help road closures or whatever we needed to detour stuff. You know, yeah. the guard was there, and that's that's another thing. You know, I think wartime kind of. I think it it didn't take away from the guard, but people just thought Middle East, Middle East, mm-hmm. Middle East. You know, and they forgot mm-hmm. about the mission here. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a right. mission here as well. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was a part of the flood. I was a part of hurricane duty. I can't even list the names. And I've been, I've had opportunity as public affairs to go to Jordan, like not a deployment, like just a training opportunity. And we have units that go to Germany, like you said, that go to Poland, that go to Alaska. Like people think that just because you're stateside and you're part time doesn't mean you don't get to experience things that you would if you were active duty and having to relocate. Like, People still travel and go see things that they wouldn't get to see because of the training and stuff that we do and the partnerships that we build. So it's just amazing over over every across all aspects of everything. Um, but before we close out, I kind of want to touch on why, like, I mean, all of y'all come from very different backgrounds, but what made you guys want to be recruiters and how did you get to this point? So I'll try to answer that question first. <laughs> um one of the most inspirational persons that um, in the National Guard side has been my recruiter. My recruiter actually recruited my cousin before he recruited me. And then the following year, when I turned 17, he came back and recruited me. I feel like he really took care of both of us, uh, making sure that we had all the benefits and everything we need and that we understand what we was getting into. Mm-hmm. And as a re- result of that, my cousin and I went back and got all our friends, brought them back to him. And it started being a cycle mm-hmm. where we were recruiting each other, I guess, so to say. Um, and I wanted to provide that same service that I got, helping young people choose their careers and get a jump start to their life. So that's kind of why I started wanting to be a recruiter. Uh, my wife finally got pregnant with our child after trying for like almost 11 years. And, Aww. you know, I kind of <laughs> – we didn't think we were going to have a kid, so I was just kind of – following the contractor money, you know, making money, having fun. Um, And then when she got pregnant, I had to kind of sit down again and reevaluate like, you know, Hey, what are you going to, what are you going to do? And all those benefits and things came back in and, you know, being a recruiter, you're going to work some long hours, but we're in the same community, the same area. I have an opportunity, you know, to know my child's teachers or, you, you know, help her friends one day and, and kind of give back and have that stability. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I never thought about recruiting before. When I was active duty, I was like, man, that's that's like a career killer. That's going to mess me (laughs) all up, you know what I mean? Um, But then when I – I'll throw uh, Mass Sergeant Jackson out. I know he was pretty instrumental in your career too. Um, I happened to go by the Armory one day and just talk with him. I was – you know, because the building was right down by the patrol office, and he was like, man, you better think about your family. You know, and, you know, after dealing with him and seeing how much he, you know, legitimately cared Mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, pushed the guard and I got in and then I was like, you know, this is actually a rewarding job, you know, because you get to help so many people. And as a as a guard recruiter versus active duty, you know, they're going to do two or three years. I might be in something that I retire. Mm -hmm. So I'll really get to watch them. You know, I, I might get to see a kid from 16 get a master's degree, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And that's, that's, that. the older I get, that's the more important those things are because those people are who's running the country next, mm-hmm. the state. Wow. So he, he and I have the same mentor. That's why we're kind of like the same person. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the same background, which is crazy. Um, but for me, I, I really wanted a challenge. Like, You know, I heard a lot of things about recruiting and, you know, people saying, well, it's going to be so hard, you know, and like what Sam Parker is saying, a career ending move, right? You, if you don't make it, then you just don't make it. And I'm like, but this is me. Mm -hmm. Like I, I make it. Um, But moreover, once I started recruiting and I realized like I was really changing people's lives. And I don't think that I really understood that before I became a recruiter. Um, I didn't understand that I would be sitting in living rooms with people and their families where they would look at me and say, if I don't join the guard, I don't have anywhere else to go. Um, I didn't, I, I had no idea that I would, you know, be the person that's out here finding schools for for people, finding jobs for people, Um, foster care for 17-year-olds that, you know, can't go back home. Mm -hmm. Um, It's been the most rewarding, amazing 
situation that I've ever put myself in. And every day is different and every person is different. Um, And every moment, you know, as you're going through the lives with these people, you know, Tom Parker's talking about um, just knowing that you're going to have those people that are going to graduate from college one day. Um, It's, there is nothing like this job. And I've done a lot. And I've been to a lot of places. Um, But there's nothing like some of the text messages that I get from the parents um, that just say thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, this, forget about my command. Like, it's whatever. Because I'm going to do my job. So so that's whatever my command is, they're always going to be satisfied. I'm going to do my job. Whatever. But it's the soldiers that I get to see on drill weekend when I show up and they're there and they're, Hey, Sergeant Brunson. I'm like, what are you doing? And I still take pictures with them. Yeah. Even, you know, even when they're on drill, I still send some of those pictures to their parents. I'm like, your kids at work today. <laughs> look at, look at this guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I've gone out to ranges um, and seen people that I've recruited. This is the first time they've ever held a weapon in their life and they are just loving it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the first time that they're going to deploy, you know, I've been to some of their yellow ribbons where they, I mean, you think they're nervous about basic training, you know, just imagine that that first time that they're going to really go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, And I feel like it's my job as a recruiter to show up Mm -hmm. and to make sure that they understand that I'm still here. Just like when you came back from basic training, I was here. I will be here when you get back from Germany, but I know you're going to go over there. You're going to do great things. Um, you know, to see them making new decisions for themselves as a recruiter is huge. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just to see them they're cause they're growing up and you know, they're growing up mm-hmm. in the guard. Um, as a recruiter, you know, we've served in the guard a little while. We kind of know units mm-hmm. and we kind of know what, Everybody does. I mean, to really just be able to sit there and, and know in your mind, I'm putting this person in the right unit. You know, we, we know each other. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, you know, if you're an MP and I know that I got a female that wants to be a 31 Bravo, I'm going to bring her to you. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to say, talk to Sarn Weaver about this job. Um, and, and that actually happened and you don't even know that that happened but you know (laughs) like she was coming over here to get her id card or something and and met you and she's like i met a I met a female that's an mp and i was like yeah Yeah. you know i mean it's a big deal so yeah just to kind of see how their their life changes Mm -hmm. recruiting is uh, there's nothing like this job i wouldn't Mm -hmm. i'm gonna be here oh yeah Yeah, i'm retired yeah Yeah, i'm I'm gonna be here um and and of course our mentor in common master sergeant jackson like this is his life Mm -hmm. like because i don't know that i understood before he really showed us you are changing people's lives these people do not forget you i mean sergeant evans is sitting here as a recruiter you know in way down in his career remembering his recruiter Mm -hmm. like that's that's major so I don't remember mine from active duty. No, I don't. <laughs> and, and you know, that's one of the yeah. things that that I that we that we know about right. recruiting is, you know, I tell them all the time, and I, I had a conversation with a mom just the other day, and I said, "Listen, when I talk to your kid, I I don't have a choice but to be honest, mm-hmm. because when your kid gets back from basic training, I'm still gonna be sitting here mm-hmm. yeah. on the active duty side. When I got back from basic training, my recruiter wasn't." I never saw that person again, Mm -hmm. you know, but you're going to come back here from training. We're still going to be here. You know, like we're talking about drill weekends. We see them at drill weekends. Mm -hmm. You know, if we lied, they know, (laughs) you know, so. What I I think a lot of people don't realize is recruiting is a beast. Mm -hmm. It really is. It comes with a lot of challenges. It does. A lot of early mornings, a lot of late nights, late night, a lot of (laughs) hours on the highway, um, however, it is very rewarding mm-hmm. when you get that text message from one of your first enlistments. And I haven't been recruiting for a long time, so in, when I get a text message that says, "Hey, Sergeant, I made Sergeant today," um, 
I yeah. just got promoted to E5 mm-hmm. or whatever. Or if you get one of those text messages from one of your S&P cadets and say, I'm commissioning in May. Um, I want to render my first salute to you. Will you come? That's very rewarding. And that's yes. kind of what keeps a lot of us recruiters pushing forward and working hard and the delayed gratification, I guess so yes. to say. It is. Absolutely. Definitely. Well, to close out, I definitely want to say that um, South Carolina Army National Guard uh, recruiters, you guys aren't just recruiters. Like, you guys are coaches, your teachers, and your mentors towards these new soldiers that are coming up through the ranks. And I think that just – signifies how much work and dedication you guys put with you stating the reason why you want to be recruiters because that's a huge thing. Um, So I, my hat goes off to each of you because I mean, it is a tough job, but it is so rewarding in the end. So um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your busy day. Hopefully I don't add on more hours to your day by (laughs) having this conversation with you, but um, we do appreciate y'all coming in so we can have these discussions and get the information out to those who are interested in the National Guard because it is a huge asset. Um, So yeah, Thanks for having us. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, If you guys like this video, make sure you give it a big thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button, and we will catch you guys in the next week's episode.